So just some basic review from what we went over last week. Last week we talked about real bare bones InDesign navigation, looking at where the different windows are for, to identify things like your paragraph and character style, um, pages, and then just sort of how to scroll through things. We're gonna be using that a lot today. Um, we reviewed um, files for uh, reviewing files for InDesign and typesetting via the hub. That's gonna come up again later today. And that involved looking at styles, sort of planning your approach based on whether or not you have special characters or images. We also looked at how styles and structure from composition are retained in typesetting. That'll be very important as we go through QC today because if you recall that graphic, that sort of snaky graphic, one of the things that we're really concerned about is making sure that those styles from composition are maintained in typesetting. And then the things we're gonna talk about today are gonna to be how the typesetter can be flexible in their approach, but still not um, introduce issues that would lead to problems in the ebook or electronic version of the book later on. And then we also learned about just identifying common elements of a book, half title pages, series pages, opening versus body text, running heads, things like that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna define kind of what typesetting is in our setup. So typesetting is a stage where the composed, edited, final manuscript is flowed into a design template. That should, you know, we're talking about combining everything we've looked at so far today. The Word document that was structured and styled and then edited and then put into the design. A uh, visual hierarchy is imposed upon the text. That gets into structure versus rendering, if you guys recall that from, from way, way back. Um, yeah, the, the visual hierarchy is um, a mixture of different type settings, maybe spacing elements, type sizes, and these kind of indicate the structure to the reader. Um, there's one thing, maybe just as a quick check-in or review thing, when we were looking at the design files last week, we, we picked a way to differentiate two different types of text. Does anyone recall how we differentiated those and what the decision was? Copyrighted. So this was more, more like a visual, there's like a visual decision that we made in, in talking about different types of text in the book. Like, is it, is it about the main content or is it like directions to the reader, things like that. And I'll just, I'll break in here unless anyone. Yeah, Marsha, that's right. Yeah, text versus display font. Those were, that was a good system that we were using, sort of setting up, um, what is it, setting up, you know, here's the body text and here are the heads and they're differentiated by different typefaces. Uh, we also established a convention of anything that is directed to the reader is going to be like a blue and we're gonna use display text versus things that are about the main hierarchy of the book and that's gonna be in red. So things like that, that's what I mean when I say, you know, we're imposing a visual hierarchy so that color and, you know, design has, has meaning now. Um, and then finally, after we sort of combine the composed text and the design text. The typesetter is going to do these typographic checks to ensure that the readability is optimized. We're going to talk about things that can kind of screw up readability and hinder understanding. And those are going to be the real nitty gritty things that the typesetter does. Uh, we follow some procedures that ensure structures maintained, the text is aesthetically pleasing, and that XML will import, export from InDesign without um, errors or file validation problems. So that's what I mean when I say that it's sort of, uh, that we're watching out for two things at once. In typesetting with our workflow, we're not just concerned about if the PDF looks good and functions well and will print well, but we're also concerned about that underlying structure. If you think about a SAM file that we looked at, it had those codes and it has the angle bracket tags, things like that. We're still concerned about making sure that anything we do in typesetting doesn't affect that skeleton of the book. Um, and the guidelines we're gonna use to accomplish this are controlling design and rendering through style. That is, uh, if I need to make sure that, uh, let's say, oh, whoops, the composition is wrong here and this line of text should be a head. Well, I don't wanna just um, make it look like the other heads. 
because that resolves one issue that resolves the visual aspect of it, the print aspect of it. But if I'm not actually changing that style that's applied to it, when it goes into ebook or electronic, then my work is going to be undone. So any kind of changes I'm making, um, I want to make sure that I'm doing with styles and things that are going to hold on to the structure of the text. Is, any, is everyone kind of clear on, on why we do those issues? And let me know if you have any questions about that. Good. Okay. Let's stop for one second just to make sure no one has any questions about that. Okay. So um, here's, here's the basic workflow. Um, let's assume that, like in that document, the design has been approved. You've worked with the designer to make sure that every element has been um, defined. When I say defined, I mean you've decided that this is what your heads are going to look like. This is what your body text is going to look like. Um, the files are sent to the typesetter. This includes images, uh, design files, and the composed manuscript or the IDTT file. If you're just sending them, maybe as a freelancer, they don't have access to the hub, and you convert the file from Word to IDTT for them, then they get that, and that's their sort of source document from which they're going to get all the text for the book. They lay out the text. There's some back and forth there. You know, they will, they, your role as the PM would be to keep the typesetter on schedule, make sure that if there's any page count issues, you know, say if you expect the book to be 1,200 pages, well, let's say 600 pages, and they come back to you and say, hey, I'm done, and it's 600 pages or 1,200 pages, then there could be some sort of issue there. Um, you'll work with the editor or the author, make sure that they get this proof for their review. Maybe go through some corrections. Um, maybe, maybe there's a proofreading step where you're handing it off to an editor. Uh, there'll be a final approval of the PDF. Um, you might do a press check once you're fine with the text. Get a, uh, you know, like a hard copy pr uh, printed, review it for issues, work with your printer, and then approve the printing. It goes off for production. And then the XML is extracted for the ebook. We do that at the very end of the process. And then that goes on to the next step, which we're going to talk about next week, which is ebook production. So that's essentially the, the, the workflow that we would consider under typesetting. Um, and then there's the, we'll sort of go a little bit more granular here. And then once I go through these steps, we're going to open up InDesign and I'm going to walk you through the typesetting process. So in moving from manuscript to typeset, and this will take some review. Just like we did for the design, if I am the typesetter, or if you are maybe handing something off to the typesetter, you still want to do that, that review that we did on the hub. That includes uploading the document, uh, opening the staff page, or the staff window, and then just sort of checking through, making sure there's no note errors, making sure there's no um, undefined or non-SDML styles. Um, I'll do a quick check. Does anyone, can anyone tell me what the issue would be if there was a non-SDML style? Maybe you have a um, somewhere the author did the review of the copy edit and they started adding text and it didn't get composed. Um, I'll say for, for the hypothetical, they added a new head and a new paragraph under that head. What would happen if that went to the typesetter and we didn't catch that issue? And, and Mark, it's another big issue there. So a lot of possible issues that could happen there. Let's say like, I'll give you um, worst case scenario there. Um, so thankfully, if you convert a document like that and it just has text that's defined as normal, the hub is going to convert it to P. It's not going to delete it or anything. But now you have these two paragraphs. And as I said, one is a head, but now it's just a straight line of text that looks like every other paragraph in the book. The typesetter is probably not going to notice that that's a head generally. They could, um, because it might look weird to have this sort of sentence case paragraph. Um, but they could potentially say in corrections, the author catches it and is like, well, that should be a level one head. Then you apply the AH style to it. Typically, it's going to be bigger, have space above, and then it starts to like push text after it as you introduce things. So you get into reflow issues. If this is caught really late in the process, you could hit some indexing issues as text shifts from one page to another. So that's why we always want to make sure before we move from one step to another, we're going to upload it to the hub and just get a look at everything to make sure everything's OK. Um, you would also similarly review the design file. Um, as you're packaging things up for the typesetter, this is your chance just to kind of confirm that the trim size is correct. That's a huge issue. We want to make sure that's correct. Um, 
if it's printing in color in black and white, you want to make sure that's handled correctly. Uh, and then one other thing is that all the styles conform to SCML, similar to what we talked about earlier. We want to make sure that everything is using SCML styles. And then lastly, this, this didn't come up before, but it, it's related to the entire process. If you're working with an F series, then you probably want to be aware of what styles the first book is using and make sure that a second book is using the same style. Um, I say this because, for example, you could have sidebars and your design file is set up to expect a certain you know, family of styles, like SD styles for sidebars. And if you do book number two and the person composing it is like, oh, well, these are all boxes. I'm going to compose them as box styles. And then you send it to the typesetter and there's this like mismatch. You know, you want them to look the same, so they should be using the same styles. So you should kind of be aware of these things. If we're working within a series, then you want to make sure the composition matches across the series, so that the structure matches across the series, and we don't get any weird issues where now we need to change the design because the styles don't match up. We're adding a little bit more time, a little bit more like inefficiencies. It could change the billing if we're making corrections like this. So that's another concern when you're checking the design file, asking yourself, well, does this structure match up with my composed file? Um, we're going to create a template file in just a minute, and that's just basically going through packaging and design. When I mentioned giving the types that are all the assets they need, or the templates we have. Mark, I feel like that's kind of a bigger question about how you handle things internally. Um, we, we still have the plan to provide you guys with a, like a basic template for these books. Um, uh, but for us internally, for example, if there's a series that uses templates, we have them in a design folder that just says, you know, template one, template two. It might indicate what the size is, template one, hyphen six by nine, hyphen 8.5 by 11. But so that might be, you know, based on how you decide to handle your press. Yes, and they'd all be in design files, these templates. Yeah, sorry if that was not answering your question, but they would all be in design files, specifically uh, a type of file called a template, which we're gonna make in just a bit. Um, okay. okay, so let's break into our InDesign files right now. I'm going to share my screen and show you where everything lives within that folder that we downloaded. Right. So I just have it unzipped on my desktop. And we're going to kind of replicate the end of the design phase and preparing files for the typesetter. So I'm going to grab this file in the InDesign folder, typesetting hyphen INDD. And we're going to look for the OTN typesetting.indd folder. And I'm just going to open that up in InDesign. You may get some warning about fonts. Um, some of these files are or some of these fonts are licensed through Typekit, which is a, an Adobe Cloud feature. So for example, Karen, you might get some, you know, I can't find the font warnings. And for now, that's okay. I'm not super concerned about, about things like that. Because um, I just want us to go through the, the process of what this looks like. And I'm gonna open up my chat window so I can see. And if anyone can just give me a, you know, okay, I got the file. Okay, I got the file open. I'll wait and then we can move on to the next step. Okay. 